Today on Basic Bytes, a shorter video in which I will show you a completely absurd fault with this Commodore 128 keyboard that I am currently cleaning and fixing. Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes, and you know, I didn't initially plan to post a video about Commodore 128 keyboard cleaning and repair because I would be far from the first person who has done that. But the fault with this particular unit is so stupid that I decided I would briefly show it on the channel. If a Commodore keyboard is in good working order, I generally leave its internals alone and simply remove the keycaps and the springs for cleaning. Or, if it is in need of a repair, I tend to tackle that first. Pro tip, it's best to do one at a time. If you remove all of the keycaps and the PCB simultaneously, the moment you turn the thing over, all of your plungers fall out. This keyboard has issues with two of its keys. The left shift key takes a more deliberate push to activate than I would like. That sort of a fault, however, is extremely common with these sorts of keyboards, especially with their current age. The second fault was more concerning, and that was that the F7 key, after being pushed down about three quarters of the way, would physically and audibly grind against something on the rest of its trip down. It was quite clear that some piece of foreign matter had become trapped underneath the plunger for the F7 key, which should not be possible from the top side. I thought, perhaps when someone had this computer open on a prior date, that some particle of something managed to fall in between the black metal base and the PCB and had now become lodged in that corner. Taking apart a Commodore 128 keyboard is much like taking apart a Commodore 64 keyboard only more frustrating. All you simply do is take out all of the many little screws, which there are more of, and desolder the two wire contacts on each of the toggle switches, which there are more of. As far as the PCB goes, I believe that some Commodore 128 keyboards had metal contacts, however, this version by Mitsumi with the black carbon contacts is a much more typical example. Since you have the PCB out anyway, you're probably going to want to give it a cleaning, but let me be very clear, this is not a PCB that you douse in isopropanol and then take your PCB cleaning brush to. The black carbon contacts need to be treated with extreme care. To clean this sort of a PCB, you want to use a very soft cloth with very minimal pressure and a minimum of isopropyl alcohol if you use any at all. The reason, of course, is that if you rub the black carbon off the contacts, your keys will no longer be able to complete the circuit and function. Flipping over to the underside of the other half, you can see that on the bottom of each plunger is a little black rubber strip. And, in terms of cleaning, you may wish to take a cotton-tipped applicator and very gently just brush off whatever dirt or dust may have collected on those strips, but you don't want to do much more than that because, just like the carbon contact on the PCB, each of these rubber strips has a conductive carbon coating on it, which enables the circuit to work. If you have a certain problem key that takes more force to press than the other keys, much like the left shift key on this keyboard, there is a simple check that you can do with an ohm meter or a multimeter set to ohms, as the case may be. 
All you simply need to do is put the two leads of your meter at either end of any one of the rubber strips, and if the resistance you are reading off your problem key is much higher than the resistance you are getting from the other keys, that is an indication that that particular plunger no longer has good electrical conductivity. My hope is that the shift key issue will be solved by the simple cleaning I'm doing today and that there isn't a greater problem with the pad on the PCB. That said, for extra insurance that it gets fixed, I will be swapping the left shift plunger with the plunger of another key that is very seldom used, which here in North America would be the pound key. And if it consequently inherits the issue, the worst that will happen is You'll have to pound the key. <laughs> uh, anyhow, as for the F7 key, can you see the issue? Let's zoom in. There is a spring in the plunger. And I don't mean the spring that's supposed to be there on the top side. I mean there's a little metal spring that is embedded right underneath the F7 plunger. Now, that spring did not come from any external source, and it is one of the gotchas of disassembling a Commodore 128 keyboard, but generally not like this. That little spring is in fact supposed to be here, right here in this open hole in the plastic. It is a ground connection between the metal plate for the keyboard and the PCB, which, of course, then grounds to the rest of the system via this ground strap. The spring and the ground strap are not needed on the Commodore 64 because the base of the keyboard is made out of plastic, not metal. Therefore, many Commodore 64 users who are opening a 128 keyboard for the first time are not aware of the spring's existence and promptly end up losing it. So, be mindful that it is there and put it aside in a safe place if you're ever working on one of these. Given how tightly the PCB is screwed down, and with how many screws, I personally do not see any way in normal use or even in transport that that spring could have jumped from there all the way into there, and I don't see any evidence that this keyboard has ever been opened at any point in the past. Therefore, this leads me to conclude that this keyboard left the factory with that spring embedded underneath that key on day one. Shame on you, Mitsumi. As for me, now that I have a fully working keyboard, I can get to cleaning keycaps and springs, although I don't think that's exactly what is meant by spring cleaning. In any case, the F7 key is just fine now that it's unobstructed by a ground spring, and switching the plunger on the left shift key turned out to be the exact right call, because, all corny joking aside, the pound key now does take a bit more of a deliberate force to press. If you found this interesting or entertaining, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. Also, if you're new to the channel, check out my other Commodore 64 and 128 related videos. Thank you for watching.